Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It is race week. The summer break is officially over and we're gearing up for a return to Silverstone for the British Grand Prix. So naturally, we're all very excited. On the show today, we'll of course be previewing all things British Grand Prix, taking a look at who the next generation of British riders might be. Plus, Alex Rins and Joanne Mir aren't the only Suzuki riders who have been forced to look elsewhere with Suzuki pulling out of MotoGP and endurance rumours swirling around where test rider Sylvain Gintoli will head and more ramblings as usual. The recording date is Monday the 1st of August. My name is Harry Benjamin. Joining me as ever is Crash's MotoGP editor Pete McLaren and former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Hewin. Now gents before we get stuck in into all things British Grand Prix which uh, we will of course do and apologies to our worldwide viewers we are all British so it's going to be a bit of a British heavy episode. So just, just bite your lip. I can already see the comments coming. But we'll be fair, I promise. But first of all, Sylvain Gintoli. I thought it was worth touching on him. He's been in the news lately. A great article on Crash.net recently. Confirming discussions um, with World Superbike as well as looking for... Um, another chance to remain in endurance but he's almost not the forgotten man but he's now on the lookout for a new job isn't he Keith? Yeah and you'd hire him wouldn't you? I mean he's one of those guys that uh, is he's, he's a Jeremy McWilliams of the uh, French nation. I thought we were going about the British Grand Prix and we we're talking about a Frenchman straight away but what a great Frenchman. He can turn his hand to virtually anything. He's as fit as a fiddle. He's one of those guys that you can rely on and that's really really that's like gold in a race team. He's got Bags of knowledge. That's the other thing that really goes down well in the team. World Superbike, it's going to be tricky in World Superbike because it's moved on again several steps since Sylvain was last there. You know, the, the, the top trio at the moment are absolutely squabbling over the championship. It's fan in fact, World Superbikes at the moment is looking very, very hot indeed. It's a great watch. And, and it's very, what's the word I'm looking for? Accessible. You know, fans can get involved in World Superbike. I think... We've talked about it, we've touched on it before. MotoGP seems to have gone slightly more towards Formula One when it comes to accessibility, whereas World Superbike is wide open with the paddock show that Michael Hill does and so on and so forth. It's a fantastic event. Uh, Sylvain will, will glide in there quite nicely if he can find a decent ride. As far as the endurance is concerned, you wouldn't want to hire anyone else. If Sylvain is available, he will be top dollar and he will get paid top money as well. Um, yeah, OK, he might be getting a little long in the tooth, but... Uh, Still a really good guy to have on side. Still as fit as a fiddle. All the things that would normally go against most people. He's a he's got a large family. He's a family man. He 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 doesn't seem to wear out. He seems to have that kind of stamina that only some riders. Have. You know, Michael Laverty comes to mind. You know, Michael Laverty still rides a motorcycle really well. Runs several teams, academies, God knows what. As a newborn baby, there are some of these guys that can do stuff that the rest of us would absolutely be worn out by. And I think that Sylvain is one of them. And you'd want to hire him. And I have to say that I still, Sylvain is a superstar, but would have been a bigger superstar if, if, if he hadn't had that accident all those years ago when, when Brooksy wiped him at the hairpin at Donington Park on the warm-up lap. I mean, uh, you know, he broke his leg so badly there. That held him up in his career at the time. But uh, even that didn't stop him from becoming, you know, world superbike champion back in the day. Great guy, really good fun, an asset to any team, I would say. It just adds, doesn't it, to the to the loss of Suzuki from the paddock, not just the race team, but also the test team. Uh, Sylvain, obviously, integral part of that, but also working with Tom O'Kane, very experienced crew chief, who's, uh, who's, who's, you know, the two of them working together with all of the Japanese engineers and European guys as well in that in that test team, bringing on the, the parts for the guys in the race team. And, uh, you know, they've done a very good job of it. Parts might not, not have arrived always as quick, some things like the ride height device as quick as course the riders would like but when things have arrived they've been pretty good pretty proven we've seen the bike developing in in addressing its weaknesses the top speed and things like that for this year so you know they've done a great job and it's just a, a shame that that is another aspect of what's been broken up by uh, the loss of Suzuki it certainly is uh, but Keith he's, he's a pretty nifty broadcaster as well so hopefully he, he can stay in that role considering it's uh, his second language uh, we always enjoy hearing Sylvan's insights across uh, a motor GP weekend on, on the British coverage yeah, that French Derbyshire accent is um, is something a little bit special, isn't it? I mean, yeah, you know, I've said it before. When you become a broadcaster, just complete. I mean, he's he's basically on double bubble, isn't he? He's, he's there as a as Suzuki's one of Suzuki's main team members, and uh, he's getting paid for doing the BT bits in between as well, which is always nice. But it, it 
you come to a broadcast camera with a head full of everything you need. You don't have to research anything. You don't have to do anything at all. You just turn up and have a good giggle with the people around you. Then every now and then relay an absolute gem that no one else knows about because they're not on the inside or as embedded as the likes of Sylvan is. So he's a he's he's a clever guy anyway. There's no doubt about that. He's funny. He, he's gregarious and he has the knowledge and he still has the speed on track as well. He's still fast on a, on a motorbike. Um, so he has everything. When it comes to broadcasting, again, he's gold, isn't he? He's just the kind of guy that you want on the team. He's brilliant. He just makes you laugh. He makes you laugh to, to, to look, even when he's not saying anything and he gives that kind of cheeky look across to maybe Hodgie or someone who's, <laughs> who's like paddling like mad trying to yeah. stay ahead. Um, he, he's got him covered under, you, you get the feeling sometimes he kind of lets Hodgie off. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> we know you wouldn't, Keith. Um, well, he's 40 years old now, Sylvain Gintoli, but I uh, wish him the best of luck in finding what's next for him, and we'll keep you abreast of that for sure on uh, Crash.net. Um, right, British Grand Prix, come on then. We've been waiting about a month to uh, look forward to this now. We're back in action at, of course, the iconic Silverstone track. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of the actual weekend's antics, we we speak about it a fair bit, or actually I think a little bit less this year than we have done in, in last year's uh, podcast, Keith. British talent, riding talent coming up through the ranks. Of course, we've got in Moto2, Jake Dixon, Sam Lowe's. Now we've got um, Scott Ogden, Joshua Watley, Rory Skinner showing great pace. John McPhee as well. It's not been a great year for him though, but he can certainly ride a motorcycle very, very well. But the more you look at it, the more it seems that the that of that current crop that I've just said, it's really Scott Ogden, Rory Skinner, maybe are the realistic options for the next British Moto GP hope. What do you think? Well, the country's feeling good at the moment, isn't it? We've just had the European champions. The ladies have just won. The Lionesses have just won the European Championship, of course, over Germany, beat Sweden as well. I mean, it's pretty fantastic. Everybody's been feeling up at the moment the weather is nice the weather is is forecast as being good over the three days at the british grand prix as well so all of these factors build into a rider's mindset i mean you, you you're feeling pumped up for it you, your best performance is going to come this coming weekend you know barring anything disastrous that happens so everyone's going to be looking forward to it it's going to be a massive atmosphere i mean five weeks we've had to wait five weeks as well before we come back this summer break has been longer because Finland obviously dropped out. So the fact is, is that this weekend is going to be a little bit special. Sam Lowe's rises to the occasion. Rory Skinner is a bit of a dark horse here. Remember Jake Dixon a few years ago when he came into the Silverstone Grand Prix as a Moto2 wild card. You know, OK, in performance terms, it looked fairly average. But from a, from a, a, a knowing Grand Prix side of the fence uh, perspective, it was a brilliant performance for him when he came in and, and worked really well. I expect the same from Rory. You're right about Scott Ogden. Scott Ogden is the real deal. Scott Ogden's looked pretty good in Moto3 at the moment. Um, he could be the he could be the star of the weekend. We'll wait and see. Jake Dixon is ready to work, work well in Moto2 as well. In fact, I was looking up some of the stats. You forget. I mean, Jake Dixon was in the MotoGP race last year. He finished last, as it turns out. Ah, sounds terrible, doesn't it? But he was only half a sec, half a lap off of the leader at the end in a in a wild card situation. You know. It, We've got some great riders. Um, where your question goes is to who's coming up for the future. Well, Scott Ogden is, is the one that's doing the business at the moment. Um, Scott Ogden reminds me, and this is an analogy that you might be in, in touch with, he reminds me of George Russell. You know, he's got that kind of way about George Russell in Formula One. We've got Scott Ogden in Moto3 at the moment and looking like he will come through. Um, always difficult to predict who's going to go where. I always use the Quattararo bloody example in that, you know, Moto2, you couldn't be sure that he was going to be a star in MotoGP from his Moto2 performances. Yeah, he was good, but hang on a second. To where he ended up in MotoGP, to where he is in MotoGP, you wouldn't have said that was going to be coming. So you can't always tell, unfortunately. It, it is difficult, isn't it, to try and predict? I mean, I've even heard people, you know, even MotoGP riders where, where teams, some people in teams will say, oh, that guy will never do anything, and then... You know, a few years later, he's he's fighting for the championship. You know, so I've heard examples such as Dovi and Alicia Spargaro now. You know, there's a lot of people that that wrote those guys off earlier in their careers, even once they got to MotoGP. 
and then they went on, as we see now, to fight for the championship. So yeah, very difficult. I mean, uh, as far as the Brits, you've got to say, you know, Jake Dixon is is on form at the moment, and as you say, Sam Lowe's though, he's he's a proven, you know, proven race winner as well. If he can maybe just come in a little bit under the radar, let the other Brits take a bit of the attention. I think uh, I think he could be one to watch as well. And uh, yeah, let's hope that Rory uh, Rory Skinner gets a solid weekend under his belt. He's got two races, hasn't he? So you know, a track that he knows and uh, gets, to, gets to know the, the class, the team, the bike, the tyres, all these new things he's going to face and could sort of build up over those two weekends. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to know, as Keith always says, it's hard to know how a rider is going to react to that pressure of the home race and uh, the expectation that comes with it. it must be really difficult. I, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. So you certainly wouldn't, would you, Keith? Uh... Well, it's, it's fantastic. Sorry. If it goes well. <laughs> I, I think that the British Grand Prix build-up, I mean, yeah. you say you wouldn't want to be in their shoes, but it, the atmosphere is, in, I mean, it starts on obviously Wednesday when everybody's rolling up and sorting themselves out. Thursday, you've got Day of Champions, which is a major, you know, it is the MotoGP charity event of the year. Um, so you've got that build-up. There'll be a lot of stage operation going on there as well. And a lot of fans will be in for the Thursday, which is unusual for... Obviously, normally it's just press day um, and the like. We've got the press conferences in the evening. So you've got that build up as well. And you're right, Pete. What happens is is that you're worn out by the time you get to Sunday because you've you've got friends, you've got family, you've got all your sponsors that have, that have been around you throughout the year that will be at the British Grand Prix. There'll, there'll be those extra pressures that you don't have when you're miles away from, from our shores. So the likes of Rory Skinner, though, you know, he's used to, that kind of pressure, even though it's a wild card situation for him. I think that, you know, Michael Laverty and his team might be under a little bit more pressure because, again, like I say, there'll be hordes of people that are there specifically to see them, specifically to support them, and they will have duties, PR duties, outside of racing and outside of all the, you know, the concentration that they've got to get inside the, the data and so on and so forth. And they will have all the, the five weeks that we've had off no one's been on holiday. They will have taken an extra couple of days here and there and it will be slightly more relaxed. But all the data that they haven't been able to sift through, all the things that they thought about but haven't had time to, to kind of instigate, they will now be at the front. And we get to Silverstone with a whole raft of things that everyone's going to be trying to try through the first free practice or two. And of course, as we said so, so often, free practice is only qualifying for qualifying. You know, nowadays you need those free practices to make sure you get through into the right qualifying sessions. So there's a, a bundle of stuff that just about every team is going to have to try or try to work out and see if it works in the early sessions there, which is why when I mentioned the weather being consistent through the three days, fingers crossed that's the case. And everyone will feel that because they will then have the time, dry track time, to work through whatever data that they've, you know, whatever they've come, uh, thought process that they've got through to get to for Silverstone, they'll want to be able to try that in consistent conditions. What do you do, talk of pressure on British riders, John McPhee, we've spoken about him on and off and it's never really been good positive news. Of course, he's been out and missed a few Moto3 uh, races so far this year off the back of another retirement at the Dutch uh, TT last time around. Uh, What's he going to be feeling coming into this race, Keith? Is he going to be feeling that pressure already, not just on track, but with the British uh, flags in, in the grandstands too? He's a pro, and I don't think he'll be... F I think he will manage the pressure very, very well. But, of course, in the back of his mind, and this is the thing, you can never get rid of the back of your mind. It's there all the time. It is the back of your mind, forcing its way forward, trying to get to the front. And what will be in the back of his mind is the fact that this could well be his last hurrah. This could be his last British Grand Prix. You know, the fact is, is that he's fighting for his Grand Prix life. If he can't find a Moto2 ride for next year, for 2023, he's out. Because Moto3, the cap is 28 years old. He's 28 years old already. So he will be excluded from running in Moto3 next year, whatever, you know, he might want to do. And there's been some big names that are Grand Prix winners that have progress no further than moto three i think of you know the only one that comes to mind at the moment <laughs> somewhat amusingly and i'll tell you why that is efren vasquez you know efren vasquez was was the guy that was taking it to jack, jack miller for, for a long time in moto three they were really fighting they used to call him t-rex um plenty of bite but short arms it was one of those slightly amusing um situations because efren was quite a short-armed fellow and he couldn't push himself back far enough on the bike to 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 stop it from 
tipping up. And the only reason I say that is because Northampton at the moment has got a dinosaur um, display on in uh, Delafray Park. So. <laughs> And I called one of the dinosaurs <laughs> Ephraim the other day, and my kids all thought I'd gone mad. <laughs> well, uh... <laughs> there you go. You, you like a ramble from you. Uh, are they completely wrong? I don't know. Um, <laughs> looking, looking a bit more at this. This uh, no, no, exactly. Looking a bit more at this uh, weekend. No round. What are we on now? Twelve of the uh, calendar. So we're well and truly Twelve. past. Yes, they're well and truly past the halfway point. Um, and what are we going to be expecting then? This weekend, uh, from the track, from the riders, who's got good performance there? We know Aprilia are stronger in the hands of Aspargro, a certainly Maverick Vinales making gains too. And of course, Aleish was on the podium here last year. Well, the big deal you've got this year, haven't you, is Quattararo is the man that's doing the long lap loop penalty. So he's already got a penalty coming his way after his shenanigans in Assen. So that's going to make a massive difference. I mean, the, where he's got to do that loop as well is... is it's a complex track, Silverstone. It's really fast. Great racetrack from a from a, a riding perspective. There's nothing like fast stuff. Everybody loves fast stuff where it's all drifting about. Yeah, I understand that the, the fans are obviously a bit further back at Silverstone. It's a, it's one of those ones where you want to get closer if you can. But the problem is when you've got a fast track that the riders all, all like, you need more runoff. So you're going to be further back as a, as a spectator in a lot of places. So it's a, a catch-22 type situation. But... I think the Aprilia is going to be, if we do have dry weather throughout the weekend, which I really, fingers crossed, hope we do. I mean, I hate, if, you, if it's going to be wet all week, then that's fine. If it's going to be dry all week, that's fine too. But it's when you've got those patches and the, 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 the inconsistencies of, of track um, that make it more difficult, I think. And it, it can throw up a, a, an unusual result. I think Alicia Spargro is looking absolutely superb for this weekend. I mean, I've said it, I've said it five weeks ago when we were first coming off air from the last round. Um, I think Aleish is, is, is race winner this 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 weekend. I, I just think that he's going to perform so well that Aprilia is looking the kind of motorcycle that will work at Silverstone really well. Um, Quattararo, you would have expected to be in amongst it, but he's got that long low penalty to work through. And because racing is so tight now, to work your way back um, is going to be tricky. It's at what point does he take that long lap? You know, he's, he's got to take it um, within a certain specified time. So it's going to be tricky for him because if he's put out right in amongst all of the thick, he's going to want to qualify as far as forward as he can, obviously, to give himself as much of a chance. But it's whereabouts and at what point in the race that he gets to take that, um, where everybody else is, how close that is, whether he reinserts himself into the pack in, a, in an advantage, in a, in a, in a good position going to be really tricky but i haven't got him in the top three well hold your horses hold your horses on that one we'll Shock get there her. we'll get there uh but yeah pete it's going to be a fascinating uh, british grand prix i think especially with the time off uh, and just most of gps i think is is in a fairly good place at the moment there's been a lot of talk about there's more overtaking in world superbike the racing's better there but uh, most of gp the, the premier class they're trying all you know the the super performance bits and bobs on every single bike it and it's been pretty decent this year you have to say it's certainly been unpredictable, isn't it? Yeah, it's not gone the way that, that I think people expected that, that before the season began. And, uh, you know, Francesco Bagnaia's problems probably epitomise that. But, uh, yeah, coming to Silverstone, as he says, you know, probably Quattro's penalty, it's also, apart from what it will set him back time-wise, is, you know, how's he going to go into this weekend? Is he, is he? We know he's angry. He was angry at getting this penalty, wasn't he? He feels this was an unjust penalty. Yamaha's team feel that way. You know, will he be carrying that anger into the weekend? That could work for him. It could work against him. It, it's going to be something that, that, that uh, you know, could be a factor. He's going to want to go out there and blow everybody away from first practice and prove that, you know, he's the guy to beat and that he shouldn't have this penalty and everything else. But as Keith says, qualifying now for him is going to be super important and the start. Um, because it'll make a big difference when he takes the, you know, that penalty, where he comes back out. And I think if you're a Leish, on the other hand, you've got to have try and get that Assen mindset back, that that nothing to lose mindset. Look how well a Leish rode in Assen when he just decided my race is over. I'm just going to go for it. And it's easy to think, oh well, he was just riding over his head, but he wasn't. He wasn't banging into people. He wasn't missing apexes. He just rode fantastically. And I think from his side and Aprilia's side, they need to kind of 
try and keep that mindset going, you know, that keep Aleish in that mindset every weekend of not getting the pressure built up on him where we saw at his home race, talking about home race pressure, you know, making that last lap mistake in Barcelona. I mean, he was under a lot of pressure, wasn't he? It's things like that that can happen. But if they can sort of tap into that, you know, what happened to Assen and try and keep it running, I think that could be important for him, you know, just to, to not think too much about this championship, to just say, look, as you, as you said, Harry, this bike took its first podium one year ago, and here they are coming back, fighting for the world championship. Something nobody, I think, would have imagined in such a short, short space of time. So, yeah, I think if Alesh is in a relaxed state and, and riding with that mindset, anything's possible. So, uh, and is it? Finales is now back on form, et cetera, et cetera. Silverstone, a fast track. Always interesting, you, you mentioned runoff. I remember walk, uh, walking, you know, around Cops Corner and thinking, why do they need so much runoff? And then you saw that accident in, in Formula One at, uh, you know, at that corner and, and, the, and the car not even just touching the barrier, but, but slamming in over the barrier and into the fence, wasn't it? And it was kind of, that's why they need that runoff. So, yeah, but there are places at Silverstone where you can get closer to the track. Um, you know, the Maggots Beckett section, for example, entry to that, there's those grass banks. There, there are areas, I know fans don't like being far away, but there are some areas where you can get close to the track. So, uh, so yeah, it's got a bit of it. And it's a fantastic track from what the riders tell us to ride. You know, it's one of the, they can really use all of the all of the power, all of the gears on a MotoGP bike. They can really stretch their legs. So let's hope the weekend stays good. And uh, yeah, it's going to be an interesting one in the race. I mean, Quattararo, we know how important it's been for him to get get the whole shot and run away at the front it's going to be almost impossible for him to do that now with this penalty. So we're going to see a fight on our hands. Well, I hate to correct you. It was actually turn one. Turn 14, the loop, is where the penalty is. Is where the penalty is. Sorry, Keith, you're on a, you're on a slight uh, delay to the rest turn of Turn one us. because it's... A... Uh, so apologies if I keep cutting you off. But I just wanted to say, I just wanted to correct <laughs> Pete because it was actually turn one where the F1 crash was. So uh, just, just, it's okay. Everyone's allowed mistakes, Pete. Everyone's allowed mistakes. It's fine. It's fine. Oh, I was it? I'm sorry. I'm uh, sorry but Keith, sorry. please, please pick okay. up. Um, yeah. Talking about the, the, <laughs> the long lap loop. It's going to be at turn 14, you say? The long lap loop is going to be the one to watch at the loop. Uh, is Turn 14 is where we're at. So um, anybody watching that is going to see whether Quattararo is going to manage to do what he needs to do. Alicia Spargro, 21 points off of Quattararo. This is his chance. This is the race that he can grab a hat full of points over Quattararo. And believe me, they're not going to be that many being given away during the course of this year. So race stewards may just have assisted Alicia Spargro in closing this up and making it something a little bit special as we go into well into the second half of the season. It's certainly going to be one to tune into if you can't make it out there. But those who can make it out there uh, to Silverstone, Northamptonshire, Keith, it's not uh, it's sort of your neck of the woods, really, isn't it? Uh, guide us round the track. It's iconic, of course, throughout motorsport and just a spectacular venue. It is a spectacular venue. It's the biggest venue. There's no doubt about it. It's massive, as in land area. Obviously, it was an old airfield in the World War Two days. Um, it's a situation where lots of history are at each and every corner of the track. Um, the fact of the matter is it's right on the A43. So you've got the M40 at one side. You've got the M1 at the other end of the A43. Dual carriageway all the way to it. Massive campsites all around there. They put on a big stage inside the track. There's a big stage out in the car park, out in the, the campsite as well. Plenty of music opportunities. It's like a proper Glastonbury trike type atmosphere there. But when you're inside the track, you realise how vast it is compared with so many other tracks you go to, so many other Grand Prix tracks that you go to. Pick in where you want to watch from. There are grass banks, as Peter said already. There are grass banks to watch from or grandstands if that's what you want. You will have a full, if you're there for the weekend, you will be worn out come Sunday night. And it's that kind of place. And if the weather's nice as well, there's, there's, there's something to do for everybody. The museum that's there, you can go and look at the museum. There's loads of entertainment going on every single night. Obviously, as I've said already, Thursday, if you're there Thursday, it's the Day of Champions, the MotoGP uh, recognised charity that will be you know, giving us the usual stage performances from most of the riders that are very relaxed at that time. And you can catch hold of them for autographs and the like as well outside of the, the usual paddock environment. So there's a lot to be done at Silverstone. I mean, it's a great racetrack. It is fantastic from a rider's point of view because it's so fast. It's not everybody's cup of tea. 
from a from a spectator's point of view because of the slight difference because it's so fast the distances as I've mentioned between the track and some of the fencing is 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 a little bit further because it has to be but I reckon it's it's one of the world's great racetracks and it is certainly one of the biggest if not the biggest event for me in the MotoGP calendar well if that didn't sell it to you it should have done so we're looking forward to it we're all going to be there of course absolutely buzzing um now apologies for any technical issues you may have picked up on throughout this uh week's episode we're trying to work through them uh, but because of those issues we're gonna make it a shorter episode so we're gonna go straight into our predictions we're back the leaderboard as it stands keith in the lead with 10 points but it's much closer I'm second on count back with nine points and Pete's third nine points. So it's all teeing up to be a cracker of a second half of this season. Um, Pete, I think you should go first because Keith's already alluded to what he'll do. So Pete, you go first. Okay, well, I'm going to I'm gonna back Fabio to overcome his penalty, I think. But I think it's going to be a battle. So I'll go, I'll go Quattro first. So repeat last wow. year's win if you like. And a lace second. I think it could be a close run. I hope we're going to see a great battle between them. And then third was a real struggle for me because, uh, you know, you've got people like Vinal is on form. But I'm going to go for Alex Rins. I think oh. Silverstone is, is his track. It's one of his tracks where he just goes well there. That that victory, last corner victory he had over Mark Marquez a few years back comes to mind. And, and uh, you know, the Suzuki's won there with Vinal as, as well. So, again, that was why. Difficult one. But yeah, I'm going to go for those three. The only thing I would add is anyone coming to Silverstone, if, the, if they'd like to see practice starts, head over to the exit of Maggots and Beckett's because that's the practice start area. There's a grass bank there. The riders will be off the racing line, so they're right by the fence. I always go down there at least once a year, uh, you know, once a session, I should say, over the weekend. It's a great place. You never get tired of watching MotoGP bikes do practice starts. So that's the place to head to if you're going to Silverstone. Get down to the practice start area as well. That's the kind of insider knowledge you need, isn't it, Keith? Uh, right, go on then. You're up next, Mr. Hewan. Alicia Spargro, I've said that for ages. I, I'm going to have him as number one at Silverstone. I think that uh, the Aprilia and he are, are right on the right kind of form for that, coming back after the break. Uh, Bang Naya, second place. And then I had a real difficulty over Quattararo. I, I didn't know whether he would make a podium or not. But I think that Quattararo probably will force his way through in the third place. That's my... That's my view. So there's my top three. Unless it rains, then Jack Miller. <laughs> <laughs> Unless, well, you say that, right? I've gone. I've also gone on Asia Spargo for the win. I do think Fabio Quattararo will fight back, but I don't think he'll make the podium. I put Bagnaia second, and I've gone for Miller in third. Don't know why. Just, just the feeling. And going left wing so far this year has done me well, much better than last year. So we'll see how that one unfolds. Let us know your predictions as well in the comments below. If you're at the British Grand Prix, uh, do let us know. Come and say hello. We love to see uh, pictures, tag us, Crash Moto GP, uh, all of that uh, stuff. And in the meantime, we'll leave it there. Make sure you are tuned in across Crash.net for all the very latest news and analysis across the week in the build-up to the British Grand Prix. We'll see you right back after Sunday to look back at all the Silverstone action. Get your questions in, leave them in the comments section or tweet Instagram or Facebook us. Just search Crash Moto GP. Please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts as well. And we'll see you right back here next week. Bye-bye. 